Hey guys, I wanted to warn you that during this video you might hear like a staticky, crackly sound. Um, it appears that my microphone cord had a short in it and I did not know that while I was recording it, only when I went back to edit it. And by that time, of course, I couldn't go back and shoot the full video. So um, it's not terrible. You guys can still hear me talk, but I just wanted to warn you that that will be in the video. And yes, I'm sure you guys can tell by my voice that I am indeed sick again. So uh anyways let's get to the video love you guys what it do scandalites and says so squad this is ashley with ashley says so and i am back with another old hollywood scandals video and before i get started i want to make it clear that i am not sure what is true or what's false in these videos i am just here to take the rumors and gossip that's been around for years and tell you guys the story today we are going to talk about superstar diva diana ross Let's get to it. Diana Ross was born in Detroit, Michigan on March 26, 1944. She was the second eldest child of Ernestine and Fred Ross. And the two eldest children of Fred and Ernestine were very successful, one being Diana herself, the other one being her elder sister. Her name is Barbara Ross Lee. Now Diana's name was in fact supposed to be Diane, but they misprinted the name with the A on her birth certificate. However, her family and friends when she was younger called her exclusively Diane and some of them still do today. When she was young, her family originally lived on Belmont Road in the North End section of Detroit. And this is where she used to play with her little light-skinned neighbor, a boy by the name of Smokey Robinson. She didn't stay here long, however, because her mother Ernestine ended up getting sick with tuberculosis. And her father Fred very much thought his wife was going to pass away. So he and the kids moved to Alabama and I'm guessing they left Ernestine up north, maybe in a quarantine situation. I'm not sure how that went, but I do know that he took his kids and they moved to Alabama. Fortunately, her mother made a full recovery and the entire family moved back to Detroit. At around 14, little Diane and her family moved to the Brewster Douglas Projects. And while she was here, she attended a magnet school. And at this magnet school, she took fashion courses like sewing, tailoring, clothing design, pattern making, things that would make her a successful fashion model. That is what she actually wanted to be. While she was still attending school, she worked at a place called Hudson's Department Store. And it is said that she was the first black to be allowed to work in that place without working in the kitchen. In fact, she was the only black for a while who was allowed to work outside of the kitchen. And it is around this time that she ended up linking up with Florence Ballard, Mary Wilson, and Betty McGlown to form a group called the Prime Mets, so they could be the sister group to the Prime, which was made up of Eddie Kendricks, Paul Williams, and a guy named Kel Osborne. Now, we are not really going to dive into the particulars of the Supremes because we all know the point of view from Diana's side, so we're not gonna go into that. We instead are going to go straight for the gusto. And no, this is not a Diana bashing session. This is an old Hollywood scandals video just like anybody else because you know Diana Ross got like a, a D-hive just like Beyonce got a beehive. And baby, they will come after you. Now, let's get to this tea. First things first, it is said that while Diana Ross was with the Primes, she and Eddie Kendricks started dating. Now, this was just a teen fling, but things got more and more serious over time. Soon though, their careers were pulling them in two different directions, so they kind of became off and on again. But some gossip says that it wasn't their careers that got in the way, the first person that got in the way was Smokey Robinson. The story goes like this, apparently the primates were doing very, very well at these dances and sock hops and talent shows and things like that, and they wanted to further their career. Well, Smokey Robinson was already signed with Motown and Diana Ross felt like she had a connection with him because this was her neighbor. So it is said that she started flirting and swinging her weight all around Smokey Robinson to try to get the primettes and audition with Motown. Some people feel she only flirted with Smokey in a heavy way and some people feel like they actually messed around and slept together. Whatever she did, it did work and he got them an audition with Motown. Now this might have been an even trade and that might have been good for the Primates and Smokey Robinson and everybody else, but who it wasn't good for was his wife, Claudette Robinson. Whatever happened between Smokey and Diana, neither one of them ever spoke about it and Claudette never seemed to have a problem or bring it up, so maybe that rumor isn't true. 
But for the people who do believe it's true, they believe this is the start of the chain where Diana slept with different people to move up the ladder. So anyways, the prom mates audition for Barry Gordy and he loves them, but he tells them that they are way too young and he tells them to come back when they graduate. And Diana in particular graduated from Cass Tech in 1962. So after they all graduate, they are all back in Motown and they are singing and Barry Gordy tells them that, hey, we can probably do something with you girls, but you girls need to change your names. I don't like the promets. Come up with something new. Diana, once she found out that the name was The Supreme, she did not like that. She felt like it was the name of a male group, and that is supposedly when Florence told her, you know, sorry about your look, the name saved. So now the Supremes are an official group with Motown and Florence Ballard is still looked at as pretty much the head or the lead of the group. And Diana is rumored to be content with this. It is said that she is not showing any signs that she wants to take over the group or be the lead of the group or anything like that. The only way that you can tell that something is even going on with her being the lead is that the songs that are being written for them are for Diana. And while this is happening, Diana is like, oh, what? You know, another song for me? Oh my goodness, this is so surprising. Like, why are they doing this? I don't know why they're giving me all these songs, okay? Well, baby, come to find out the reason that she was getting all the songs is because she was sleeping with one of the writers of the song. His name is Brian Holland. He was one of the three parts of Holland Dozier Holland. But not only is Diana being devious by sleeping with Brian Holland, she also is being very devious and mischievous in other ways. Let me tell you a little story about 1963. Motown had the hottest girl group out, honey. And no, we are not talking about the Supremes. We are talking about Martha Reeves and the Vandellas. They had come out with a song called Heat Wave and it had taken the world by storm. By this time, Supremes haven't even had any hits, okay? They are still just basically unknown. So Barry, in order to get their name out there and to get them a little bit more popularity, have them opening for Martha and the Vandellas. So they're opening, singing a little song, whatever that might be. Martha Reeves is looking out of the curtain, just watching every group go until it's their turn. And while she's looking at the Supremes, she is like, oh my gosh, they have on some beautiful dresses. Like, dang, Barry spent that much money on them? Then she gets to looking a little closer and she like, those look like our dresses. Like, why would they purchase us the same type of dresses? This can't be right. Cha, she go back and look in her room and her dress is gone, honey. Diana Ross has taken their dresses and given it to Florence and Mary. And so the Supremes are wearing Martha's them dresses. Martha Reeves is furious because see, now their whole show is messed up. What are they gonna do? They can't possibly go on stage after the Supremes wearing those exact same dresses. So Diana Lil Messy Tail has stolen their shine, honey. And Gossip says that as soon as the Supremes came off stage, baby Martha Reeves started chasing Diana. She was hawking her tail. But shy Diana Ross Lil Skinny Tail was too fast and she ran into the room and shut the door in Martha's face. And it's not only Diana in the room, there's Florence and Mary, they ran in the room with her too. But Martha is banging at the door, open the door, open the door, you know what you got coming to you, you stole our dresses, how dare you or whatever. And while she's banging on the door, Diana Ross is inside calling Barry, basically telling him, you know, Barry, Martha Reeves trying to jump on me all because I got our dresses mixed up. I didn't do it on purpose. Barry says, open the door to Martha and give her the phone. So as soon as Diana opens the door, she hands the phone to Martha like this. So Martha grabs the phone and is like, hello. And Barry is like, you know, Martha, leave her alone. Don't try to jump on her. And Martha is like, okay, I know Mr. Barry Gordy, sir, but she stole our dresses, sir. And Barry is like, ah, she said she made a mistake. She didn't mean to. Come on, Martha, leave her alone. You know what I'm saying? This is just a small stop on the tour anyway. She definitely won't do this when y'all are at the Fox Theater. So just leave her alone. And so Martha is like, mm, mm, I want to beat this girl up, you know. But eventually she's like, okay, okay, Mr. Gordy. But when she turns to give the phone back, Diana Ross is nowhere to be found because Diana basically knows that Martha most likely will still jump on her. So she's gone. So Martha asks Florence and Mary, you know, where y'all friend at? Where she at? Because I'm looking for her. And they're like, we don't know where she at. And so Martha's like, y'all ain't gonna tell me, huh? And they're like, nope, we ain't gonna tell you where she at. 
After Martha left out of the room, Mary and Florence started laughing, but it is said that Florence was like, I wonder when Diana gonna get her tail beat for real. Like, one day somebody gonna jump on that girl. So that was a little side story of gossip that I thought you guys might want to hear. But anyways, let's get back to Brian Holland writing Diana Ross all these songs. Eventually, Diana Ross did sing a song that was a crossover hit. It brought a lot of success to the group. That song was called, Where Did Our Love Go? And it was one that was written by her lover and the rest of his writing mates, Holland Dozier Holland. Once again, like I said, if Diana Ross was putting out to get forward, okay, maybe fair trade, I don't know. But we run into another problem. Brian Holland was also married to a woman named Sharon. And this is allegedly what Brian Holland had to say about the affair. He basically said that he would be with his wife. You know, he would be sitting in there with his wife, but he didn't even think of her. His mind would be on his lover, Diana Ross. He dreamed about her day and night, and nothing that his wife said or did could have made him turn his attention on her. He even said that while he was thinking about Diana Ross, it gave him the words to their next hit song, and that was Baby Love, because he was kind of just thinking of her and like, oh, that's my baby love, I love her. And he started writing the words to their next hit. So with Brian Holland, Diana Ross really hooked her one, honey, because she has the writer messing around with him, and he's daydreaming about their sessions together and how beautiful she looks, takes those thoughts from those daydreams, writes songs which turn out to be hits for Diana Ross. Baby, she got this thing sewed up, you hear me? But I guess Brian must have daydreamed a little bit too hard because baby, he forgot about his wife. And me and I'ma tell you right now, if you're with your wife or laying beside your wife and you're constantly thinking of another woman, your wife can tell, she can feel you slipping away. That's what happened to Brian Holland. Brian sitting up there getting clean one night, you know what I'm saying, putting on his best suit, he got on his cologne, he's smelling good, looking good, trying to be one of them cats, all right? So I'm pretty sure Sharon was like, uh, where you going? What's going on? Well, I just thought I'd go out tonight. You know, I'm going to meet my homeboys at the 20 Grand nightclub. We just all going to chill and stuff. And so Sharon is like, okay, well, it's just going to be you and your boys? Yeah, it's just going to be me and my boys. That's it. Baby, Sharon let him walk out that door. Gave him some time at that nightclub to get good and comfortable. You know, he probably drunk, you know, dancing with his homeboys, just having a good time. And I imagine Sharon was doing something like this. Uh-huh, this long enough. Oh yeah, baby, he good and comfortable. She walked through that house, got in that car, and got to driving down to the 20 grand nightclub. Walked in the club, and what did she see? Her husband hugged up with Diana Ross. Child, she stalked over there with them shoulders going back and got over there and was like, uh, Brian, this what we doing now? Uh, is this what it is? And you know, Brian, uh, what, what you talking about? Ain't nobody doing nothing. What you doing here? What you, don't worry about what I'm doing here. Is this what we doing now? You telling me you leaving my house, your wife, so you can go be with this heifer? And baby, maybe at this point, Diana tried to jump in and say something, you know, to defend herself, defend her character or something, honey. Nobody knows. But what we do know is Sharon went to work on Diana Ross. She went to work on her head, baby, pulling off her clothes, pulling out her hair, just basically just going to work, going to work. And there were a lot of witnesses to this. One of those witnesses was Miss Betty LeVette. Yes, she's made another appearance. She, however, cannot stand Diana Ross. So Betty LeVette wrote and said that Diana Ross was getting her behind whipped. She was looking like a little bird out there trying to fight. This is what Betty LeVette said, and she's not the only one that gave this version of events. There were a few others who gave this version of events. But Brian Holland claimed that his wife Sharon came in and she basically said some bad demeaning words to Diana Ross and that was the end of it. But folks said Brian Holland is out here lying because he's sitting up there embarrassed because they was fighting over him. They said it wasn't no just tossing some words. They said his wife was tossing them hands, baby. However, I suppose somebody broke them up. I'm not sure. All I know that it is said that Florence and Mary Wilson kind of like started circling Diana Ross. And Diana was probably still trying to fix herself up looking crazy and got beat up. Florence got in front of her and was kind of like, you know, that's it. You know, that's it, Sharon. It ain't finna be nothing else. You ain't finna touch her again. You know, basically became this protective figure to cover her friend. Now, Diana Ross and the Supremes got huge in 1964, and so they breezed through 1964. We are now at 1965, and things get kind of hazy around here, the details, because 1965 is when supposedly she started being intimate with Barry Gordy. This 
further supports the claim that Diana Ross did not become lead singer because she was messing around with Barry Gordy. Now here's my opinion on it. Even if Diana Ross did not get with Barry Gordy to move her way up in the group or whatever, she still liked the perks of dating the boss. Even if it was just the feel of, you know, everybody looking at her like, ooh, she got Barry Gordy, you know, dang, he wrapped around her finger. Even if it was just for that. If 1965 indeed was the first time that they became intimate, this also puts to rest one more rumor. And that is that Barry Gordy cheated on his wife, right now, Gordy, sexually with Diana Ross. Speaking of Barry, Diana, and Raynoma, there is a little gossip story out there that's messy, 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 honey. Raynoma was still working and kind of being around Barry Gordy even after their divorce in 1964. But since they are divorced, Barry and Diana Ross are clearly flirting with each other, being with each other, you know what I'm saying? So Raynoma has to feel like, you know, this girl has ruined my marriage. Baby, let me tell you what Barry Gordy did to this woman. So Raynoma, come here, come here. And so she's like, yes, Barry, I need you to go and be a chaperone to the Supremes. And she's like, really? You want to send me to watch over Diana Ross and her group? And Barry is like, yes, can you do this for me? And she's like, okay, I guess I will. Cha, they got on that dog on tour. And don't you know Diana Ross had the nerve to turn to Ray Noma and be like, um, hey, Ray, hey, listen, I understand that we know each other personally, but I'm going to need you when we go out in public, in front of the audience, um, in front of the fans, I need you to call me Miss Ross. That little face that I made was all right Noma could do, honey, because at the end of the day, she had to call Diana Miss Ross. A lot of people were 38 hot over this, honey, because to them, it seemed like Diana Ross had taken this woman's husband, and then you got the nerve to tell this woman to call you Miss Ross? And she's older than you? Really? Diana ain't cared a thing about it. Diana said, call me Miss Ross. But anyway, let's get back to the subject at hand. So you remember me saying that things are kind of hazy around 1965 because that is when she starts messing around with Barry Gordy. Well, it appears that she's actually juggling about three men at this time. Not only is she talking to Barry Gordy, she's still messing around with Brian Holland and she's still messing around with guess who? Eddie Kendrick. Yes, baby. Apparently, Diana had kept it up with Eddie this whole entire time, off and on. And if this is true, this solves the long-ass question that people asked about Barry Gordy. Why was he so upset and why did he care so much about her relationship with Eddie Kendricks when clearly she slept with other men as well? But I'll tell you the reason why. Eddie Kendricks is rumored to be Diana Ross's one true love. And if you think about it, it all makes sense. He is the only one that she messed with that she was not trying to get a leg up. She was not trying to get anywhere by messing with him. She just messed with him because she liked him. And if that's not enough evidence to make you believe, there are also the rumors about how emotional she got about Eddie Kendricks and their relationship. Let's get into some of those rumors. It is alleged that at one point, she and Eddie were on stage singing, I'm gonna make you love me, yes. Yes, I will. So anyways, they're on stage singing that, right? And Diana Ross starts crying, tears just flowing all over her face, okay? And everybody believes she's upset because she loves Eddie so much and she wants him to love her the same way, but he just won't return that same level of love. So Diana tells the stage people that, you know, she's not gonna sing that song anymore. She wants them to take the sheet music and take it off the stage. She don't wanna do that anymore. There were a couple of more incidents reported. One incident is that while she and Eddie were in rehearsal, baby, singing some song, he said something and she slapped him across the face. I mean, told the side of his face up. And once again, allegedly it had something to do with their relationship. And here is the last rumored incident to prove that she did love Eddie Kendricks. And this happened after Eddie Kendricks married his wife, Patricia. Anyways, this is the incident. Patricia and Eddie are sitting at home in their house. All of a sudden, Diana Ross drives up to the house and she gets out the car and she is acting a belligerent fool. She's hollering and screaming, Eddie, get your tail out here. Are you crazy? You can't leave me. You can't do me like this. All right, all right. I wanted to act like David Ruffin for a second there. But anyways, she really is outside of their house like having a complete breakdown. It gets so bad that she picks up a brick, honey, and throws it through their window. We are talking about a woman that is all about her career all about her image, but she is willing to throw all of this away by acting a complete donkey in the middle of this neighborhood. I mean, easily. 
easily somebody could have whipped out a camera. So to add all of that up, this is why Barry Gordy had such a problem with her relationship with Eddie Kendrick. So now we are at the part where Diana Ross and Barry Gordy are dating. Everybody knows about it. And of course she uses this as a ticket to treat Mary Wilson, Florence Ballard, and pretty much everybody else she comes across like they're beneath her. And her treating people this way is rumored to be what pushed David Ruffin to say what he said to her. And that was him allegedly asking her, hey Diana, how many have you sucked? No, no, you know what? Better yet, what haven't you sucked? Chai, just a mess. But this does not phase Diana Ross. You know, she is tough as nails. She can take all of this slander, all of these rumors. She feels like she's a boss and she continues to act like it. Child, listen at this next rumor. Listen at this. This sound like Barry Gordy put this rumor out himself, okay? So, we all know that Diana Ross has these diva tantrums. She throws a tantrum, nobody can really calm her down, she's telling everybody off. Supposedly when she was doing all this, nobody could control her, so they would hurry up and get on the phone and be like, Mr. Gordy, we need you right now, we need you right now. And he'd show up to the hotel with his shiny church shoes on, walking up to the room, and then he would go in the room and give her some of that good Motown loving, and that would just calm her right on down. Now, I'm not saying that this didn't happen multiple times, but for the rumor to be out on the streets like, oh, you know, Barry Gordy and his love making ways is the only thing that can calm Diana Ross down. Boy, go on, cause it sound like you made that room up yourself. Moving on from Diana Ross's diva tantrum and Barry Gordy being the man of the hour, there is another rumor of something Diana Ross did when she pulled a boss card. And that is when she was on tour with Gladys Knight and the Pips. Gladys Knight and the Pips were doing very well. People were giving them standing ovations. Everybody loved their songs. And Diana Ross was getting jealous of this. She felt like the Supremes were the main attraction and this group had no right stealing their shine. Child, let me tell you, Gladys Knight and the Pips, they're rehearsing and getting ready for the next show. And you know, Gladys just out there, I got to go, I got to, huh, huh? Don't call for me, Mr. Gordy. We gotta go home off the tour. Yes, baby, while they were rehearsing, they got a call from Barry Gordy basically telling them to pack their bags and they are leaving the tour. And it's not funny, but it kind of is because while Gladys is on the phone talking to him on stage, baby, she looked to the side and what do you know, peeking behind that curtain was Diana Ross, honey. And what you sitting up there looking at? You just head up there and called this man to send these folks home and then you got the nerve to be sitting up there peeking around the corner, checking out the scene. Girl, she be shame myself. Listen, y'all, I forgot to add this little bit of tea, but baby, I just could not leave it out, so I had to do a voiceover. But anyways, listen, I guess the Supremes were on tour or something like that, and Barry Gordy was with them. Well, apparently he thought that the Supremes were on stage because he brought another woman back to his hotel room. Him and the other woman sitting up there getting hot and heavy, and all of a sudden, he hears a knock at the door. And baby, you know that chill ran right up his spine because he knew that it was Diana Ross on the other side of that door. Chai, he started scrambling with that other woman, got all her clothes and stuff, and told her to get her naked behind in the closet. But finally, he opened the door, and he was right. It was Diana Ross. And she came in there, wrapping her arms all around him, ready to get busy. And he had no choice but to go on with it. So that other woman was trapped in the closet all night, listening to their sounds of love making. Mm, mm, mm. As time passes, Diana Ross feels like she is too big for the Supremes. So, of course, she leaves them in 1970 and she wants to go solo. And then it's around November of 1970 that she and Barry Gordy get into one of their freaky little moods, honey, and they have one of their good Motown sessions. And once they're done, they're basically just wanting to return to life as normal, but nothing is normal about this. Diana Ross is pregnant. And it is said that when Diana Ross found out she was pregnant, she begged and pleaded with Barry Gordy to marry her, to make it official. You know, she had done far more for him than any other woman. And he had married other women before. He had children with other women before. So she felt like he should marry her and claim her child. And that is when for the first time, I do believe, Diana Ross found out just how ruthless Barry Gordy was when it came down to his business. I really feel like she underestimated him because she saw him be ruthless to other people, but never ruthless to her. But she found out that doggone time when he basically told her, I'm not marrying you nowhere. We can't do that. It's not good for business. 
What is that gonna show for me to marry you and now we're having a child? That's gonna basically show people that we've been messing around this whole time. People are gonna feel more sorry for Florence. People are gonna wanna bring lawsuits, different things because they're gonna feel like that I favored you as an artist if we were to get married and I was to claim this child. And you know, Diana Ross, like any other woman is like, so? Who cares? Let them think what they think. We love each other, don't we? Marry me. It doesn't matter. We can face all this together. But once again, she totally underestimated Barry Gordy's love for his wealth and his business. And he told her no. So now the reality sets in for Diana Ross. She realized that she has been used. You know, as much as she thought she was using him to get whatever she wanted to get out of it, she realized that he had used her just as much. Matter of fact, even more. He made millions off of her and she really didn't mean that much to him like she thought she did. Clearly not enough to become a family with her. And because she was furious about this, she wanted to make him pay. She wanted to make him jealous. So she bumps into this guy at a store. And you know, she claims that, you know, he's just so lovely, he's so good looking, he's so sweet, that he basically just stole her heart right at that instant. And her and this new guy, whose name is Bob Silberstein, had not even been dating for that long. Diana is just laying it on super, super thick. By the time she's two, three months pregnant, they are married. And there's one more thing I want to make clear. Not only was she trying to make Barry Gordy jealous with this marriage, she also had to marry some doggone body to claim parentage for her child. You know, she was a superstar. She could not mess up her name, her image by being an unwed mother. That they get married January 1971 and by August 1971, Diana Ross has her first child. Her name is Rhonda Ross Silberstein. And Bob, of course, knows that he's not Rhonda's father, so he ends up adopting Rhonda. But then you have the public. They all want to get a glimpse of Diana Ross's child. Oh, we want to see the beautiful baby. So Diana and Bob had to get very, very calculated with this move because at the time they were presenting this baby as if he was her father. So if you notice, if you look at the magazine where they showed him as a little family and Rhonda was just a little tiny baby that is in black and white. So nobody could really see the true color of baby Rhonda. Soon she had two more children by him. There was Tracy Ellis, born in 1972, and there was Chutney, born in 1975. And here goes another little quick tea about Diana Ross. This is when she was pregnant with one of her children, honey. She was in the studio and she was recording with Marvin Gaye. They were making their duet songs together. So the whole time they're recording, Marvin Gaye is just smoking like a freight train, okay? And Diana Ross is just like, <laughs> Oh my gosh, my baby, I just can't take this. Mm -mm. So she gets on the phone with Barry Gordy and she's like, Barry, I can't do this. You need to tell Marvin Gaye that he is smoking too much weed. I am pregnant. I can't deal with this. And so Barry is like, okay, I'll take care of it. Just like he always did for his little Diana. So he calls Marvin and he's like, Marvin, I need you to stop smoking in the studio. Diana's pregnant. She can't take it. Marvin told Barry Gordy, heck no. I'm going to continue smoking my stuff. So, you know, I don't know what to tell you. And he did, he continued smoking and that was the end of that. Now most sources think that because Barry Gordy did Diana that way as far as not claiming her child, not wanting to marry her, he wanted to appease her by getting her to star in his new movie vehicle. And that movie was Lady Sings the Blues. And she starred as Billie Holiday in Lady Sings the Blues. Since the movie made so much money and since Diana did a fine job and since the pairing worked so well with Diana Ross and Billy D. Williams, Barry Gordy wanted her to star in his next movie vehicle. And that movie was called Mahogany and that was released in 1975. And that movie too did very, very well. And when 1976 came around, a lot of Supreme fans were very sad and very disheartened. And that is because Florence Ballard had died in this year. And I suppose that Diana Ross felt like people expected her to show some emotion and, you know, act like she was concerned about her friend. Baby, they said Diana was walking down that aisle, flanked by her bodyguards, and in the middle of walking, she just uh, fell out crying and wailing, and she got to scooping up Florence's children and laying them across her lap. And 
cuffing their little faces and kissing them. And, you know, it, it was a lot. And people thought that she was putting on a show. They felt like she was being dramatic. So a lot of them booed her because they felt like she was still trying to take over the show and take over Florence's life. Even after Florence had died, they felt like she was trying to upstage her. And I do believe Diana was a little bit hurt or at least bothered by this. She couldn't think about it too much because her movie career was doing quite well. Warner Brothers wanted her for a new big movie. This movie was called The Bodyguard. Yes, as in The Bodyguard. And Diana reads the script and she's like, you know, cool, I would love to do this. Just slap my name at top billing and we can get this show on the road. And Warner Brothers is like, ugh, there's a little problem there. And Diana is like, what? They're like, yeah, well, you know, we got Steve McQueen to be your co-star and he feels like his name should have top billing. And Diana Ross is like, no, my name needs to be at the top. Steve can be right up under me, but I'm not going up under nobody. And they're like, you know, please, Miss Ross, you know, you just got into acting. He is the actual professional actor. Please let us have his name at the top. And Diana Ross is like, no, if y'all can't put my name as top billing, I'm not doing it. She wouldn't budge and neither would Steve McQueen. So that whole thing about the bodyguard ended up falling through. But to Diana, this was perfectly fine because she heard that Barry Gordy had another movie in the works and this movie was called The Wiz. Then she found out that Barry Gordy had no intentions of putting her in this movie and certainly not as young Dorothy. And she went up to him and she's like, yes, I can carry this role. I know I can. If you just give me a chance, Barry, give me a chance. And he's like, no, you can't play Dorothy because you're too old. You're 33 years old. Dorothy is a young girl, about 12, 14. You cannot play this role. And Diana's like, okay, well, we can fix that. She doesn't have to be a young girl. She can be a young woman. Up her age to 24 years old, make her a secretary or something like that. We can make this work. And Barry is like, oh my gosh, no woman, no. So Diana goes around and above his head and convinced producer Rob Cohen to arrange a deal where he would produce the movie if Diana was starring as Dorothy. And everything worked out. Everybody signed on the dotted line. But when the director found out that it was Diana Ross playing Dorothy, he quit. He said, I'm not going to be a part of this monstrosity. She is too old to play this part. They ignored it and went on anyway. And the movie was an international flop. People hated it. Child, they said folks was in the audience yelling out like, what her old A doing up there? And Diana, after it was over, tried to like scoot on past it and move on like it didn't exist. Baby, no. These folks would not let her create this whole big mess and think she gonna skate away from it? Oh, no. It was all in the newspapers, magazines, and everything. Just how much a mess this movie was. But baby, let me tell you something. That movie might have been a mess, but honey, grade A rumors came out for that movie set. The tea is finna get real, real spicy and messy right here. Michael Jackson and Diana Ross were having an affair, honey, while they were filming The Wiz. But the thing is, is that the tea ain't over with yet, honey. It is said that Diana Ross was still messing with him, even when he was messing with Brooke Shields and some of the other Stephanie Mills people like that, that she would show up at his door or, you know, call him and be like, you know, send her home. Why is she here, Michael? Why is she here? And then he would do that or push his girlfriend away and then she would mess around with him and then she would just basically leave him hanging. And they said that this whole ordeal right here is kind of what warped Michael Jackson to be messed up in the mind and also what warped his face to start changing to look like hers. So I know y'all this is some heavy gossip, heavy rumors. I'm here to put it out to y'all. This is what has been said. After the failure of The Wiz, Diana had to do something about her image. So she and Barry started working on a huge album to put out for her. This album was called Diana, and this album was going to show the hip, modern, in the now, Diana Ross. And the album did splendid. It is her best-selling album to date. She sold millions of copies. And because her new solo album sold this well, Diana started to see just how much she was worth. And she started to feel like Barry was not giving her the money that she was worth. And to be truthful, he wasn't. So Diana put on her boss cap and started shopping around. And it just so happened RCA was willing to offer her $20 million 
to sign with them. And this amount blows everybody away because at that time, nobody had been signed to a record deal worth that much. But Diana, still trying to be loyal to Barry without just leaving him hanging, goes up to him and says, Barry, you know, these people are offering me $20 million. Can you match that? And Barry was like, no, I'm not gonna match it for you. I can't match it for you. But here's something even worse. Not only did he not give her the $20 million, when she chose to leave and go with RCA, he gave this woman a severance package worth only $250,000 out of all that money. But honey, I guess business is business. So the year is now 1981 and Diana Ross is signed with RCA and she puts out some good songs, mainly the remake for Why Do Fools Fall In Love and she also gets her star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. This is around the time that she started hanging out with Cher and they were really good friends. Some would say just about best friends and they are just hanging around each other a whole lot. And because they are hanging around each other a whole lot, Cher introduces Diana Ross to her boyfriend and his name is Gene Simmons and he is the front man for the rock band Kiss. And Diana is like, hi Gene, bye Cher. Yes child, sat up there and met Gene and snatched him away from Cher. I bet Cher was sitting up there in the middle of the road with her long hair just blowing across her face like this child. That woman had got her mane and gone. Gene and Diana are together for a little while. They're dating, they're going out together, they're having fun. And then Diana introduces Gene to her ex-sister-in-law. And her ex-sister-in-law is like, hi Gene, bye Diana. And just like it happened to Cher, it happened to Diana. Her ex-sister-in-law supposedly snatched Gene Simmons right out of her grasp. Here we go, back into the whole Michael Jackson thing because after she finished dating Gene, it said that she started again messing around with Michael Jackson. And I don't have much detail about this time period or really any other time period she is supposed to have messed with Michael, but I am told that after they stop messing around in this time period, he starts getting the idea to pin a song called Dirty Diana. In 1984, Diana Ross got married to her second husband. And this guy's name was Arna Nass? Arna Nass? I'm not sure, I put the spelling on the screen, but. And Diana is said to have been head over heels in love with this man. After they marry, she does become a stepmother to his three older children, and then they have two sons together. And their names are Ross Orna and Evan Olaf. Now Diana and Orna are said to have a very happy marriage in the beginning and she's okay on the home front. But career wise, she is not where she wants to be. She has put out some good music with RCA and they are hits, but they are international hits overseas. Nothing is popping off for her in the US. And while her records are not doing well in the US, Two other people's records are skyrocketing in the US. This gossip rumor says that Diana Ross was insanely jealous of Michael Jackson's success at this time. She could not stand the way that he was rising to the top and quickly becoming the king of pop. But remember, I said she was jealous of two people, not one. So it wasn't just Michael Jackson that she was rumored to be jealous of. There was also Whitney Houston. You know, Whitney Houston was now the new black girl on the block with, with the big, wide, flirty smile and the beautiful voice. And she knew how to flirt with audiences as well, just like Diana did back when she had first started with the Supremes. So Whitney now has all of this spotlight. She is headed to being the biggest female pop star in the world. And Diana Ross cannot believe that these two young people are coming up and stealing her crown and the Whitney situation gets really bad when later on Whitney is chosen to star in the movie The Bodyguard. So with all of this going on, Diana Ross just felt like she needed to find a better fit for her than RCA and she went back to Motown. This Motown is not Barry Gordy's Motown anymore. By this time, Barry Gordy has sold Motown. Since Motown did not belong to Barry Gordy anymore, I think Diana Ross kind of felt out of place. She didn't really feel at home anymore, so she really focused her career on making more movies. And one of the movies she did was a made-for-TV movie called Out of Darkness, and she had a starring role. And once again, she floored everybody with the way she acted. After this movie, I think she did a couple of more movies, and I do know that one of those movies were called Double Platinum, and she did this movie with Brandy, and there's supposed to be a little bit of mess on that set because they both had diva attitudes. Then in 1999, she made headlines for very bizarre behavior. The first thing she did was kind of like flop up little Kim's boob on an award show. I think it was like MTV Awards or something like that. And she kind of just was like, 
bloop, bloop to little Kim's breast and everybody just kind of lost their mind, which to me it was not a huge deal, but y'all know how the uh, media is. And then the second thing that happened in 1999 is she went off and basically tried to assault and slap and hit a female security guard at an airport. And Diana Ross said the reason she did her like that is because the security guard was like touching her in her private places, you know, and she just wasn't comfortable with that, so she started slapping away at the security guard. And she could have been acting bizarre like that in 1999 because maybe she knew her husband was cheating on her. Because, honey, he definitely was. In the year 2000, her husband, baby, got his side chick pregnant. Diana Ross was very, very humiliated. And they ended up divorcing. And she went through some trauma with this because she loved this man. However, she was able to pull herself together mentally and emotionally and physically because she wanted to go on a Supremes reunion tour with Mary Wilson and Cindy Birdsong. And this tour would have happened and would have been a success if Mary Wilson would have agreed to her pay on the tour, but she did not. She felt like they were paying her too little and she felt like as an original Supreme, she should have been getting paid what Diana Ross was getting paid, which was around 15 to $20 million. Let me just say this right here, I'm sorry. I know unpopular opinion, I always got an unpopular opinion. I get that, but baby, it's an opinion, we all got them. I'm just gonna say this. To me, Mary Wilson should have taken that money because yes, Diana Ross was getting paid 15 to $20 million, all right? But the thing is with Mary, they only wanted to offer her $1 million at first, at first, $1 million. Mary said, uh-uh, I'm not doing that. That's too low, I'm an original Supreme. So these folks came back and was like, cool, $2 million. Here go Mary, uh-uh, no, no, uh-uh, I need more money than that. They come back to the table, $4 million, and this is gonna be $2 million from the original people, TXA, whoever was putting the show together, and then Diana was given an extra $2 million of her money just to make Mary happy. And I understand a lot of people are like, yeah, Ashley, you know it's not about the money, it's about the principle, you know what I mean? She was an original Supreme, blah, 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 blah. But no, listen, uh-uh. That's $4 million for a 29-day tour, okay? 29 days for four million dollars. Mary says no to that, all right? Just to turn around and have to tour just about the whole freaking year just to break a million, if that. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, y'all, but that just does not make sense to me. If it were me, I would have put all that little catty, jealousy, envy mess aside, and I would have took my four million dollars for 30 freaking days. And because Mary did this and they didn't want Cindy anymore, Diana tried to go ahead and do the Supremes tour, but she got a rude awakening and she found out that it was not just all about her. When she marketed her tour as the Supremes tour, those people expected the Supremes to be there, not Diana Ross and two backup singers. So baby, folks was complaining, folks was booing, people was mad, people wasn't buying tickets, she couldn't even fill the stadium, you know, couldn't fill the arenas, because nobody wanted to come and see Diana Ross with two imposters. They paid their money to see the Supreme, so she found out real quick that it wasn't just all about her and people did love the other Supreme. I think her life kind of unravels a little bit around here and she starts drinking very, very heavily because in 2002, she got arrested for a DUI. And she was only sentenced one day in jail, but man, she looked just so sad and pathetic. Like, you know, everything that she had done in the past looked like it was now coming back to bite her. And she looked like she was truly, really unhappy with herself. And then in 2004, her life became even more rough because her ex-husband, Orna Nass, died while he was trying to rock climb. He fell off of a mountain and he perished. So she was at a very bad period in her life. And so from then until now, Diana has kind of just still performed shows, but she's mostly lived her life in the shadows. She's not really in the news. She's not making headlines. So we don't know that much more about her. So this is basically the end of her old Hollywood scandals, but y'all know at the end, it's always some extra T-bombs, honey. So let's go ahead and drop them. First things first, Diana acting like Ronda Ross Silverstein was really Bob Silverstein's child came back to bite her. And that was around 1983 when Ronda was around 13 years old. She basically was wondering why she didn't look like her sisters. Why is my hair not like my sisters? Why is my skin not like my sisters? So that is when Diana basically broke down and let her know that, you know, your father is Barry Gordy. There's also a little bit of tea about Tracy Ellis Ross, honey. And child, they said when she was a little girl, she was something else. 
it said that basically she would do things to like kind of get her mama to snap on people. Like she thought she was better than folks. The next tea spill is about Diana Ross's brother. His name was Arthur T-Boy Ross and he was a singer and a songwriter and he wrote hits for plenty of people. And on June 23rd, 1996, police found T-Boy and his wife Patricia rotting and decaying in a basement in a house in Detroit. They had been bound and gagged and because of that, they suffocated. But now let's move on to the last drop of tea. And honey, this is a doozy and I believe that it's fake. It really sounds stupid to me, but y'all know that when I read Gossip and Tea, I include it all in this video so we can talk about it in the comments. All right, the last big doozy of tea that I have is that some people in the world, for whatever reason, believe and have put a rumor out that Michael Jackson is the child of Diana Ross and Smokey Robinson. I know. Then the people get so messy that when you confront these people with the other gossip of, okay, well then I thought y'all said that Diana Ross and Michael Jackson was messing around. Well, yeah, that's true too. He just didn't know he was messing with his mama. Now that just sounds stupid, and I'm sorry to even tell y'all that, but y'all know when y'all tune into this channel, y'all tune in for all of it, no matter how ridiculous. So anyways, we are at the end of this video. Please go ahead and smash that like button. Go ahead and click the subscribe. Go ahead and share. Comment, tell me what you guys think. To the new subscribers, welcome to this big old lovely family. I love y'all so much, and I will see you guys next time. Bye.